Thank you for coming. I hope that my presentation today uh, stimulates questions. I, I'm trying to be a somewhat uh, controversial. I was born not far from where Donald Trump was born, so uh, that's part of my personality, shall we say. Um, although my politics are a little different. Uh, so, just for those of you who are, have not attended the previous ones, the fundamental idea here, of course, is this concept of a paradigm shift, which is often attributed to Kuhn, and the, uh, the focus there is on some shift that, that changes the basic practices of a field, okay? And um, two, two quotes from Kuhn that I think are, are relevant. Um, the notion that it's only during the transition, during a paradigm shift, that scientists really have a philosophical discussion about what their field is about. And that during the rest of the time, they are trying to fit um, whatever is going on into the, into the current paradigm. And, I, and so I think that's something to think about. And of course, to remind you of the, the distinction between you know, the popper view of the progress of science, which was sort of linear, um, that the idea of the paradigm shift from, from Kuhn was that, um, that, the, um, uh, that the field would, you know, if you measure sort of accuracy or progress, that the f a field would, would uh, increase, improve in its, uh, its, the accuracy of its models, if you think of it that way, and that then a paradigm shift would happen and, and actually your understanding or appreciation of field would decrease for a while before it began to increase and that eventually you would have an increase. And so um, I think the, another you know, relevant quote here um, is, is this one about that the paradigm shift changes the most elementary assumptions, right? And thereby changes the view of the field. And I think that definition is the one that I would like to use, which is quite different from what is often used, especially in biology, where it is used to mean every slight change in methodology or something. And so we're gonna focus on the kinds of changes that are of this scope. Um, you know, Examples that are given in Wikipedia, I'm not sure I agree with these, you know, are things like uh, Mendelian's, Mendelian inheritance as opposed to pangenesis and so on. Okay, so here's what I see as the first biological paradigm shift, and that is that prior to the acceptance of the scientific method, the idea of biology was, it, even was, it wasn't even called that, it was natural philosophy. The idea was that you were supposed to try to figure out the essential characteristics of organisms and that those characteristics essentially defined them. And, and the classic example, which couldn't be further that from the truth, was that you wouldn't say that a person or that humans were hairless apes you would say you were, they were the thinking animal, okay? And so by imbuing this quality, you'd sort of defined uh, the, 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 the species or the, the, the organism. Uh, and of course, it turns out that, you know, th that definition is uh, somewhat at, uh, uh, controversial nowadays as to whether or not we're the only animal that can think. Um, but the point is that the goal of this was to somehow reflect upon different organisms and discover their essential, or define, really, their essential characteristics. And the major change that happened there was to go from that type of essentialism to uh, an empirical approach where you say, okay, I'm not so much interested in the purpose of this organism or the the, you know, my, my, my reading of what that organism is about, but more about describing uh, and, and using empirical approaches to learn what the characteristics of that, uh, of that organism were. Um, and of course, this process is uh, what leads to the so-called scientific method, which emphasizes dis uh, uh, experimentation to 
to describe systems. But then, of course, the classic thing of the scientific method being the basis upon which you do everything, that what you're seeking to do is to discover, is to propose hypotheses and then either prove or disprove them. And, of course, that becomes uh, the major paradigm for many, many, many years. By the way, for those of you interested, there's a, an alternate view uh, of this whole transition here. Uh, the, the, the transition from um, the uh, essentialism to, to Darwin's, um, uh, uh, Darwin's approach to taxonomy and natural selection, that apparently there were many people who were also beginning to think along those lines before Darwin. Uh, and there's an argument uh, about that in, in that paper that I cited there. So now we have um, th what we've just covered there in a, in a sweeping way was the transition um, to, from this essentialism to, to a descriptive scientific method approach. But the focus during that time, up until in, the, in about the, the mid-1700s, is on, and actually past that point, um, the focus is on observation, on being able to try to come up with a theory f that is based on observation and is not based on manipulation or doing experimentation to get at why something is happening. All right? So the vast majority of the work is descriptive observational work that says, okay, this is the, the way in which a particular species mates, or this is the way in which a particular organism searches for food, or this is, you know, whatever, uh, whatever activity, whatever biological uh, uh, behavior it is, the approach to doing that was much more to, d to describe it than to understand how it was happening. Uh, and so then the next major shift, shift then comes with the, the shift to uh, under, trying to understand mechanism. And this is usually represented <coughs> by uh, the, the switch to the cell theory. Um, that is, the cell theory said that all organisms were comprised of cells. Cells were the fundamental unit of life uh, and that um, you could then explain or, or potentially explain the behavior of organisms by the concerted action of all of their cells and the cells were the, the, um, the uh, entity that, would, that could reproduce and so on. So that was a major transition because it started to then get to the question of how organisms could do certain things. Okay? And with that, another major uh, development is the development of the germ theory, where you go from the idea that somehow the air is bad and therefore you get cholera, to an actual mechanism, namely an infectious agent, you know, that gives, that gives, uh, gives you the disease, okay? Now, what happens as part of that is by going from description, which is largely at the whole organism level. Of course, there, are, there were people doing dissections and so on, so there was work that was being done at less than the organism level. But by going from a, a, a largely whole organism view of the world um, to begin to address mechanism, that also was associated with the adoption of reductionism. That is, uh, that we would try to be able to understand a larger uh, entity by reducing it to, it to its parts, figuring out the part, what the parts do, do, and then being able to put them back together, okay? So that, that shift to mechanism involved basically taking things apart further and further and further and further to the point where you would get individual molecules, complexes of molecules, organelles, whatever, and then, as part of that, you would learn the biochemical properties of those things, how they bind together, how, what, what uh, chemical reactions they, the enzymes that are proteins that uh, catalyze, and, in parallel, learn 
the uh, connection between genes and biological behaviors. So taking a biological behavior, which is an external, externally visible thing, and bringing it all the way down to the level of an individual gene that was supposed to be responsible for that. Okay? So in both of those ways, that, that represents a major shift to this um, mechanistic reductionist approach. And this approach was ridiculously successful. Um, it's, um, it, it, at least in biology, of course, it's been successful in other fields as well. Um, but you know, some of the, some of the uh, examples of the remarkable successes of this approach are shown here. And back to the topic, I want to draw the distinction between things like this and paradigm shifts, okay? All of these things, which are frequently cited by people as things that represent paradigm shifts in biology, I believe are all part of the same paradigm, the same part of this reductionist mechanistic paradigm, uh, and they're just examples of learning a particular uh, mechanism or, uh, uh, and uh, perhaps a, a particularly generalizable one. Uh, and, you know, uh, Watson-Crick DNA structure is, a, is probably a, a very good example of that. Of course, we had then for the first time, we had a mechanistic explanation for how for, uh, cells reproduce themselves and pass on information from, from division to division. Um, but fundamentally, it's still within that paradigm. And associated with that paradigm, is the notion that there are biological rules, laws, principles, different people use different words, such that the idea was that you would be able to learn these rules or principles from examples and then generalize them to other examples. And this was the basis in almost all of these studies were done in what are called model systems in biology, which means you study, for example, in the heydays of genetics, you study Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. And everyone studied that. And the idea was that whatever you learned from studying the fruit fly was supposed to tell you some fundamental biological principle that would be applicable to other organisms. The same thing in molecular biology was, uh, with, was E. coli. Okay? And so the idea was that you have these model organisms, and nowadays there are, there are many more model organisms, including mice and, uh, and uh, zebrafish, for example, that have characteristics that make people think that the principles learned from those models will be applicable elsewhere. And some of the most important laws, principles, whatever, that, are, that were learned during this time or were put forth during this time are the, the, the two so-called so central dogmas. So they're, you know, really, the, the central dogma of molecular biology, as Frick called it, um, is the central dogma. And the idea there was that DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, and it doesn't go the other way. Okay? Um, and this was you know, central in, to the... Um, to our understanding of biology throughout this, this heyday period. Another, often called the second seg uh, uh, central dogma, is the idea that you have some sequence of nucleotides or amino acids, those are the components of either DNA or um, proteins, and that those, that sequence, which is just a linear set of, of uh, amino acids, for example, will give rise to a specific structure of that protein. So that protein will fold up, right? So uh, you can think of it as that sequence being, um, you know, those, those, uh, those balls that, that you may have played with when you were a kid where you stick them together and, you know, you can make sort of a chain out of them, right? So that that's what a protein is. And that it would fold up into some structure and that that structure would then determine the function of that particular protein. And notice that I said the function, okay, which is another important thing that's going to come up. Associated with that 
was the idea, the principle, that each gene produced one protein or enzyme, and that protein or enzyme did one job. So that you could say, this is the gene that's responsible for this job. All right, the so-called one gene, one enzyme. Law, principle, right? By the way, <laughs> Crick um, used the word dogma uh, without understanding the meaning, the usual meaning of the word dogma. Uh, uh, he, and this, he said this in a, a number of interviews later in his life, that he didn't want to use law and he didn't want to use hypothesis. He wanted something a little more exciting <laughs> and he really wasn't aware of the connotations of dogma, but he picked it because it sounded cool. Uh, and so thereby causing a lot of problems for a lot of people because, you know, for example, um, people who don't really believe in science say, well, science is just a bunch of dogmas like, you know, like this, right? And so you, and you're admitting it by calling your, one of the most important concepts a dogma. So then the problem is, and this is where I come in, by the way, this is in the 70s. I, I, was, I was in grad school uh, uh, from 74 to 79 when many of these, when the house started to collapse. Um, these are all exceptions to the rules that previously had been laid down, okay? Um, the first was that the idea was that organisms had a set of genes and they passed on their genes to their progeny. But it turned out that in many organisms, especially microbes, they pass genes between each other, so-called horizontal gene transfer. That was just like not allowed under the previous understanding. That broke a fundamental principle of inheritance, right? genetic inheritance. Then we have the idea, then we discover that genes can hop around, the so-called transposons. The genes are not a, a fixed set of you know, linear sequence, but rather pieces can jump all over the place. They can, and they can also, that's also related to, to, to the idea of gene transfer. Then what, something that still blows my mind, you know, given how I was originally educated, we discovered that RNA could make DNA, right? That enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Right? And this is used by, especially by viruses. And now, like one of the fundamental things that we all thought was true turned out to not be true. Okay. It got worse, right? Um, we discovered that genes were not monolithic things, but that they were interrupted uh, in by other DNA, by, by that not, they were not linear things that encoded a protein directly, but they were interrupted by pieces of DNA that weren't used to code for the protein, so-called introns, okay? And that the way in which the RNA was actually assembled was that you took the DNA sequence, copied it to a sort of a provisional RNA sequence, and then edited the heck out of it, by a process called alternative splicing. And then that gave you the RNA that made the protein. So the idea of this gene being directly tied to the, to the protein, the sequence of the gene being directly tied to the sequence of the protein also went out the window because you now had the possibility that one gene could be cut and pasted to produce different protein sequences, right? Which is also way outside the pale. I can keep going, but I'll go out. the last one I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is prions, or prions, depending on who you, who, you, who you talk to. These are proteins that are infectious agents. They are proteins that can take over proteins in a, in a host cell and make the proteins of the host cell into prions, prions, right? so that you can have an infection that, ha that, it, that reproduces, it carries on, right? The true infection, but it has no DNA, no RNA. It's just protein hijacking a cell, making that cell turn its proteins into the form of the prion, and then that can be infecting an X cell, okay? So now, you don't even have 
DNA and RNA in the picture in order to have it have a, an infectious agent. Okay, so again, many people would refer to these as paradigm shifts. I wouldn't because they are just more mechanistic discoveries, right? They are just learning more things that can happen in the, in the enormously complex world of biology. But that, so that begins to happen and, and the whole notion of what are the rules, what are the principles, you know, starts to break down. And, and so then another thing begins. Sort of um, during this, it, it sort of tail end of this, and this so, so in the 70s, while well, I was in grad school, um, the, the um, technology behind recombinant DNA is discovered by Boyer and Cohen, um, and that involved the ability to actually manipulate yourself the genome of an organism, any organism at, by these days. And as part of that, then, DNA sequencing evolves, and the decision was made to um, try to sequence the human genome, which, which happened, and that begins a, a transition where uh, experimentation is increasingly automated. And that's another very important trend. Uh, when, you know, when I was in grad school, every single experiment you did one at a time, you know, with a pipette, and then along comes the DNA sequencer where you had uh, the ability to sequence, you know, well, depending on what year it is, tens to hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands of bases in a day. Um, and that's what, uh, so that's what this line is showing here. This is the, the number of uh, bases, that's the unit of, a, of DNA sequence, uh, the number of bases you could sequence today. So this is going um, uh, up dramatically. And the associated cost, of course, also fa falls. Okay, so this, for many biologists, this is really the first um, major event that clues people into the idea, well, we can start to automate this better. And of course, this coincides with the computer and, and you know, uh, electronic uh, advancements and so on to make, that makes all of this feasible. And a number of other things develop a technology that's called high throughput screening. Um, you know, where basically you can do enzyme assays, these things that measure the activity of a particular protein, and you can do them faster and faster um, using robotics typically. And things like the um, DNA microarray are invented where you can make a, uh, an array of, uh, of, of spots where each spot has a different DNA sequence on it, and then you can measure how much RNA there is by having it bind to the DNA, and then read off this, this, this plate, and thereby get thousands of measurements of, of, about what RNAs are being expressed in a particular cell all at once, okay? And the, then I think the really important thing begins. Remember one gene, one enzyme, one gene, one protein, and the fundamental idea behind reductionism is that you can reduce things down and you're going to be able to figure out which gene you know, produces what, that, what protein that does this one thing. And that, that, you know, that an enzymatic reaction or whatever it might be. And so when people would do, people started doing large scale genetic screens where they would look for, trying to identify the gene that causes various behaviors, various phenomena. And a really strange thing started happening. One group would do a screen and they would look for genes that were affecting a particular behavior, eye color in Drosophila, whatever it might be, secretion in, in yeast. And they'd get a whole bunch of genes and they'd name them, you know, secretion one through, you know, 50. And they'd say, oh, these are all the different enzymes involved in secretion. And then somebody would do a, a screen for another uh, f f uh, behavior, and they would get another set, and they would call those, you know, behavior one through 100. As we started being able to sequence, it turned out that a lot of those genes were the same. 
that genes were involved in more than one thing. And when we, um, so when uh, people started doing large scale experiments for measuring the interactions between proteins, where the expectation was that there would be a small number of proteins that are interacting to do a particular job, like a small number of parts in your car that you know, put together the wheel. All right? But instead, we got stuff like this. There were lots of proteins interacting with each other, and that was unexpected. That was one thing that was unexpected. Another thing that was slightly unexpected, people started doing screens of, once DNA sequencing is possible, to find which genetic mutations are associated with which disease. The idea being, OK, let's find the, the gene for autism in this case. Well, if you measure how much association there is on the y-axis between having that gene and having the disease, so each peak says this gene is associated with that disease, look at all the genes that are associated with autism. Okay? And that's just one case. Here's, an, uh, uh, here's another example. When people started looking for how many things could you mutate that would affect just one enzyme's activity, found 163 different things, 47. Huge percentages of the genes were affecting each other. And so these are just early examples. It got worse from there. And this, is, this gives rise to what people nowadays call hairballs, which is whenever you do one of these large-scale experiments, it almost always happens that almost everybody's connected to almost everybody else. Right? So the view changes fundamentally so that you know, the brakes are connected to the carburetor, and the carburetor is connected to the air conditioner, and what the heck? So, all right, so that um, then sort of, for many people, is the end of reduction, the reductionist model. And the rise of what are called complex systems. It's a concept from engineering that a complex system is something that you can't explain its behavior from its parts. It's the, the, the sum of the parts create a behavior that the individual parts don't show. And that is, you know, killer for reductionism because the whole idea was that you could take things apart and figure out the parts and then you put them back together and you understand how the whole thing works. And that gives rise to the so-called systems biology paradigm, it's often called, or the field. Um, and because you could, do, you could have automation, you could do large-scale experiments, they were producing lots of data, the idea is, oh, well, okay, yeah, uh, we'll deal with it. There's a lot of interactions. We'll just make a computer model to describe all the interactions that are happening, and we'll be good. And that's... And the idea of that was, a major part of that, a major emphasis in systems biology papers, was taking that data, building a model from it, and then using that model to make predictions for other cases. Now, in order to be able to make predictions for other cases, you had to believe the model was correct or was valid. So that there was this concept that you would validate your model by doing a new experiment and seeing whether the model predicted the correct result. Okay? The problem with that is, I forgot the first rule of modeling. All models are wrong. All right? And so, you can't prove a model to be correct. It's not possible. Right? And so, the, it, it all, part of this idea of proving the model also led to the idea, well, once you've proven your model, you can also use your model to hypothesize future things and form traditional hypotheses that you could then go out and test. But along the way, part of the problem is, if that model is supposed to be describing the underlying principles of the whole system, 
and there aren't any underlying principles, what good's the model, right? In other words, what does it mean to start building a model if you believe there isn't a fundamental principle that you're, that you're fitting to, all right? So that's a philosophical issue that has been discussed a fair amount. Okay, that brings us to what I think. So, so far we've had three um, paradigm shifts by my definition. That brings us to, to what I think is the last. And that is, maybe humans aren't cut out to be biologists. Right. And one of the, uh, well, the first uh, demonstration of the concept that maybe we can hand this job over to uh, computers is this work from Ross King's group. The premise of which was that you could build a box that had automation like what we've seen already that had you know, instruments that were automated inside of it, and that the specification of what experiments to, be, to do would be done by computer. The principle behind that was that there was a very specific problem that they were interested in, in showing, and that was matching genes to enzyme activities. Okay? One-to-one -one correspondence, there were a lot of genes, and a lot of enzyme activities where they didn't know which was which, which went with which. So it turns out in that kind of case, you can design ahead of time an optimal strategy for doing experiments to match them up. And it's, it's uh, what's called a decision tree. You do the first experiment. If it comes out this way, then you do this experiment. If it comes out the other way, you do this other experiment. And, then you, then you, and, and that can be provably optimal. And then, essentially, the machine is just to do those experiments. And it solves that problem completely. When you're done, you know of the matching of all the genes to all the, uh, uh, to all the enzymes, assuming that the, the instrument's working properly. But that, important as it was, doesn't address the real problem. And that's really, so the previous approach fits within its automation, it's computer controlled automation, but it really still fits within the mechanistic reductionist paradigm. Right? One gene, one activity. The real problem is this. The space of possible experiments is now too large. When reductionism fails, there was an important thing that happened. Assuming reductionism, and assuming we have around 10,000 genes, when I was a grad student, we could realistically think, well, we'll just divvy up the genes. You know, you'll work on this one, you work on that one, and we'll figure out what all of them do, and we'll put all that together, and we'll be done. And I was convinced we'd be done by now. <laughs> right? We'd be moving on to something else. I don't know what it was, but, you know. All right. The problem is, which was, I think, not well recognized in the field, is only largely being rec starting to get, be recognized now, is that when you remove the reductionist hypothesis, the number of experiments now becomes the number of things, proteins, to a power which is the number of things that are interacting. And that's not good. <laughs> right? um, you know, even a small number of interactions being allowed means you know, a very big number of possible things to test in combination with each other. Uh, I don't expect to live this long, and I really do want to get that answer that I've been, you know, looking for since I was a grad student. Um, so, we can't use any of these approaches that involve decision trees and wandering, you know, we can't decide ahead of time what the decision tree would be. It's a space is just too, too large. That introduces what I think is the, the, this, a major part of this next um, transition, this next paradigm. And, th and that is, f to, to understand that, I need to tell you about machine learning. Machine learning largely is passive. I collect a bunch of data, like Netflix data or you know, Facebook data, and I give it to a computer, and the computer builds a model that tells me whether I'm going to like a particular movie or whether I'm going to want to talk to a particular person or whatever it is that their model is about. But there is a field called active machine learning, 
which gives control to the computer over what data to collect. And you've all been experiments, been the subject of experiments of active machine learning. Whenever Netflix sends you a recommendation of something to see, it's actually using active learning on you. It's asking you if you want to see that, and then based on your answer, it changes the model. All right, that's active learning. And so this is model-driven experimentation. Okay, so fundamentally, part of the paradigm shift here is that instead of the systems biology paradigm of proving your model, the goal of active learning is always to improve your model. All right, so you don't choose experiments to test your model, you choose experiments to improve it. And the way you do that, it turns out, in most cases, is by choosing those experiments that you have the least confidence in your prediction of, the results of those. That's how you um, can optimally improve your models. But the really big important thing is, we have to hope that it's possible to do this without doing all the experiments because we're gonna be here a long time otherwise, okay? And so that's the potential promise of active learning. Now, interestingly, part of what active learning is about, the basis of it, is learning principles that allow you to predict other things for, without having done the experiment, but those principles are falsifiable and can be readily modified, so they're kind of continuously being updated as opposed to rigid principles. Uh, I'm going to really quickly show you this. We did an experiment, since we're running a little bit long. We took some data from um, this PubChem database that's run by NIH. It's data on lots of different assays and lots of different drugs. And what we did is we showed that if you measured the speed at which you learned which drugs affect which targets, which assays, Right? So you have lots of assays, lots of drugs. Which drug affects which assay, has a positive effect in which assay is the, is the goal. And we plot here how many of them we got right. And we plotted versus how many experiments we did. So if you're doing, the red line is, you know nothing, you do an experiment, you get the answer, and now you've increased your accuracy by one. And so that's just linear improvement in accuracy to go from zero to 100% by doing all the experiments. This is a predictive model that is common in the drug discovery field, where you try to learn a model for one target and learn how, all, how that target is affected by lots and lots of drugs. And this is a model that tries to learn how all the targets are affected by all of the drugs, and it learns we're only doing 2.5% of the experiments, it learns a model that has identified almost 60% of the positives. So that's kind of the principle. That's just an example that, in this case, we can save a lot of money by not doing a lot of those experiments, potentially. Okay, so, then the question is, what's, okay, is, what's this new paradigm? I would argue that in the new paradigm, what we are doing, instead of this principle-based mechanistic type studies, what we need to be doing is designing systems to learn models as opposed to trying to learn principles ourselves. And then the whole goal is to give up on learning the, the laws of biology and learn empirical predictive models, uh, and that um, has to be done without ever being, having to be able to get all the data, okay? so. Part of then to close, I'm going to just um, deal with what I think is a transition in these four paradigm shifts between uh, t uh, of the role of the biologist. Okay, so as we go to empiricism, the role of the biologist is accurate description, getting accurate data. This is the basis of taxonomy, for example, through that whole period, describing accurately how long the bones are, how, you know, how many feathers you got, all these kinds of things. That gives way to mechanism, mechanistic studies and reductionism, um, where the emphasis is on hypothesis generation and testing. Come up with a good hypothesis and test it. That's the model there. That gives way 
to high throughput experiments, but where the interpretation of the experiments is still human and still relies on the, the scientific method model of hypothesis generation. So when you do this, you're supposed to generate a hypothesis and then explicitly test that. But the new role, so moving from this to this, is just about designing high throughput methods and appropriate model creation software and getting out of the way. So that's what I think the last transition will be. So um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer questions.